Welcome everyone and uh, uh, good morning uh, for Mark and uh, good night for Astrid Rotzel and uh, good afternoon for us in Italy. Uh, the second lecture but by Mark Decay concerning integral design and research is uh, in a few minutes uh, going to start. I would like now to take uh, uh, five minutes uh, to introduce this meeting. As many of you know, Mark Decay from the University of Tennessee is visiting professor at the U of University of Venice uh, uh, in the research infrastructure IRIDE that works for uh, an integral design environment. In the same infrastructure, we work in the Pride Laboratory, uh, which is uh, developing studies on the modification and innovation of the Psi paradigms uh, in a, an analytical uh, dimension of uh, complexity and uh, within an integrated vision of project culture. As you know, Mark is professor uh, of architecture and uh, his current uh, scholarship is about designing to experience uh, nature via buildings. This lecture series uh, will uh, introduce a, a framework for uh, thinking about uh, design and uh, design research at any scale. It is an approach built uh, on the integral theory and uh, developed uh, for uh, architecture in the, in the book written by Mark, Integral Sustainable Design Transformative Perspectives. The collaborative teams uh, represented in the, in the integral design and research lecture series uh, use this approach because uh, it is uh, useful uh, in uh, tackling uh, and uh, making sense of uh, the difficult and complex problems facing the design and uh, planning disciplines today. Throughout the lectures, you will learn about uh, diverse integrally informed ap application in uh, sustainable design, watershed planning, architectural photography, design to address climate change, people's inhabitation of buildings, biophilic design and research project methods. Today we will attend a lecture by Mark Decay and Astrid Rotzel from uh, uh, Deakin University in uh, Australia. Astrid uh, is a senior lecturer, uh, lecturer uh, and um, at the School of Architecture and Built Environment and at Deakin University uh, with a background and a PhD in uh, architecture. Uh, Astrid Rotzel uh, takes research and teaching centers around the environmental implication of human interaction with the built environment. Her research aims uh, to enrich human experiences, um, shape environmental values, use resource responsibly and uh, respond uh, to place. Her current research uses integral approach to investigate the interplay of uh, occupant action logic, cultural narratives, energy performance, as well as built and uh, environmental context. Astrid is a formal Australian participant of uh, International Energy Agency, uh, Energy in Building and Communities for uh, Occupant Centric Building Design and uh, Operation, as well as Definition and Simulation of Occupant Behavior in Buildings. Well, the title of this second lecture is uh, Integral Design Research and Approach. And uh, in this occasion, we will hear of uh, application of the integral model to design research, introducing uh, Wilber's integral methodological pluralism 
and uh, adaptation from design, including uh, mixed methods, answering uh, multi-perspectival uh, research questions. The lecture will also present a research project on uh, human inhabitation of buildings by a multidisciplinary team. Thank you, Mark and Astrid. Thank you all. Mark and Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you, uh, Margarita, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's, of course, a pleasure again to be invited to be here to speak to you. I've met really a, a, an amazing caliber of dedicated researchers. And I would say that you have, uh, in my mind, a unique program. I've never really seen so many postdoctoral research fellows and PhDs in one school particularly a design school focused on so many different diverse and ambitious projects. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Astrid Rotzel. Astrid, as uh, Margarita said, is a senior lecturer at Deakin University in Australia, where it is just past 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. So thank you, Astrid, for being unreasonable enough to be with us at what's a very late hour or early hour for you. Astrid and I have been working together for several years now on understanding how integral thought uh, can help us solve these thorny design and research problems. And uh, she is very steeped in the integral approach, and I really like working with her because she pushes my thinking along almost every time we talk about something. So she's going to tell you about one of our projects, um, but first I'm going to start off and then I will hand it off to Astrid and then finish up if we have some time with a few more comments. I always like beginning, as you may have seen last time, with sharing my intention. And my intention for our time today is this, to empower your academic life by inspiring you to stretch into taking some new perspectives. I say empower because my topic today, our topic is the integral model applied to research. And design research is always complex. Today, we have many singular fragmented design theories, each promoting its narrow view and none really capable of making much sense of the complexity in the built environment. And yet each one of those competing theories is claiming its own validity. I say empower because I assert that if you are engaged in research and if you engage powerfully and committedly an integrally informed approach, then you will have a breakthrough in your research effectiveness. So just in case you missed the, the first lecture or if you did, still review is always good for all of us. I wanna review just a couple of uh, concepts that we covered there and then we'll build on that and talk about research. So integral theory is this powerful mental framework that comes out of the philosophy of Ken Wilber. Uh, it includes five major frameworks or components. We call them quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types. Last time we talked about quadrants and levels. We're not going to go further than that today. Next time we'll pick up with some, uh, some of the other concepts. This little cartoon helps to explain these four perspectives, which are simply as I like to think of it, the inside and the outside of the individual and the collective. So you have two primary distinctions yielding four perspectives. Everything on the right side is object. You can see it, it has form, it has location. You can measure it, you can weigh it, you can map it, you can diagram it. Everything on the left side, subjective, invisible. You cannot see it at all. If I wanna know about you and your experience, I have to ask you. So it's not evident until you tell me. The upper part is individual, the lower part collective or singular and plural if you prefer. 
Here is how I represent these four fundamental perspectives for design. In the upper right, we call these quadrants. They're really diff just diff ways of representing diagrammatically fundamentally different essential perspectives. So in the upper right, we call this the behaviors perspective. Performance is what counts for value. In the lower right or systems perspective, fitness to context is what counts for value. In the upper left or experiences perspective, we value human experience, our own individual experience. And in the lower left or cultures perspective, that values collective meaning. Now, if we go one step deeper, and here I'll use the example of sustainable design. You could answer this question from other perspectives other than the topic of sustainable design. But since that's the one I've looked at mostly, we'll dive in there. So from the upper right behaviors perspective, we talk about shaping form to maximize performance, the logic of engineering. In sustainable design, we want to minimize resource consumption and pollution. This is technological sustainability. It's the most familiar perspective. From the lower right systems perspective, we like to talk about shaping form to guide flow. Sustainable design solves for ecological problems. So this is an ecological sustainability. It's also a social sustainability because we have social systems that we can look at there. From the culture's perspective, we're interested in shaping form to manifest meaning. So one way of doing that is to look at how sustainable design can connect people to nature. So we can talk about a cultural sustainability. And then finally, from the experiences perspective, we're engendering form, using form to engender experiences. So we're orchestrating rich human experiences of nature and natural forces. This is experiential sustainability, but it also can be building a consciousness of sustainability. So it's all in the interior of the individual. So from each of these four perspectives, what counts for success is entirely different. And therefore, if the criteria are different, then the design questions are different and the design solutions. But also, if we're looking at research, the research questions that we might ask are also different. And therefore, the methods that follow to answer those research questions can be different. So last time, we also did a little exercise and looked at each of these four fundamental perspectives on the world and noted that each one is available in each moment in your own individual awareness. So yes, it can seem complicated, but it's also quite simple if we simply shift the perspective that we're looking at. And that's one of the practices, that's one of the disciplines. We also covered the idea of levels of developmental complexity with higher levels as more complex, more inclusive than the less complex structures. And as that lower diagram illustrates what can be known, what can be cared about if we move up in our stages of development in human consciousness, then new questions, new horizons, new phenomena can appear that just simply weren't available to us at a previous or less complex perspective. We introduced the idea that each level of complexity can be considered in each of the four perspectives and that the level at, at a level of complexity in one quadrant, you can generally correlate that with levels in the other quadrants. And finally, we also discussed last time how each fundamental perspective unfolds in, in stages, one at a time, in a vector of increasing complexity, but also in a nested way. That's when it's healthy. So the new stages don't replace what came before, they include them. So when all is going well and healthy, we say that the new stage or level of complexity transcends the disaster of the previous stage, transcends what didn't work, and it includes its dignities, it includes the workable aspects of that stage. 
So now let's look at how we might think about research using this framework. In my view, researchers that use an integral research approach need to define a big why. And those of you who've been working with this know that why is the question we come back to over and over again. Why is the reason for the rigor? We need the methodology to create the rigor, but why are we doing that? The collective why of an organization or teams within that organization or your individual why as a researcher, that's going to help define the questions, help define the problems. And they should be problems that are big enough and difficult enough and important enough for us, for some collective to organize around. Next, we start with the ideas that looking through the lens of each perspective, different valid problems arise. For example, climate change occurs from the upper right perspective. It never occurs as a problem when you're using upper left phenomenology, individual perspective to view the world. It can only occur from a reality that's disclosed by the behavior's perspective that is able to measure things. And only then from a high enough level that can represent changes in complex data patterns over thousands of years. Then climate change occurs as a problem. And we say, what are we going to do to solve it? So each perspective generates significant questions. The principle is this, no significant question can be solved by the singular perspective that generates it. Say that again, no significant question can be solved by the singular perspective that generates it. So if the question is big enough, it requires the methods of multiple perspectives. So here's the point. You can make big contributions, but integral research itself is not the problem that we're trying to solve. This integral research approach is more like an operating system. And on top of that operating system, you can write a software app for literally anything. So it's a meta methodology for addressing the design discipline's thorniest problems, difficult questions. So I say what's possible for you is anything that you can imagine and the caveat being in which you can enroll others because if the problem is significant, you probably cannot solve it by yourself. What's possible is also solving significant problems collectively. So um, I'm going to propose a hypothesis, which is that if you can't distinguish the perspectives, then you cannot have an integral future emerge. And here I mean distinguishing your own perspectives and the perspectives of the project and its methods. So here's one example I know about. This is um, from Deakin University. And you'll hear from Astrid in a few minutes. She was very instrumental in instigating this integral approach to the research there for their school of design and construction. They were interested in how was a design school, which has high teaching load, going to play in the research game at the level of their university with pretty high expectations for publication? How could they use their staff more effectively to solve bigger problems and make use of teams, particularly interdisciplinary teams. So they call this integral design futures, and there are a number of different projects there taking on looking at a thorny problem like how do I solve homelessness, for instance, right? Or how do we restore um, degraded landscapes from a, a history of mining and so on. Uh, so Astrid leads a team from Deakin that I've also had the pleasure to be working on. 
And this research team is working on the project that she'll show you. Uh, it's about an integral approach to building inhabitation. So I'm going to use that to introduce the basic idea that we call the integral research approach. Our project was called an integral, still is ongoing, an integral sustainable design approach to human inhabitation of architectural spaces. Initially, we were interested in occupant behaviors, but soon we realized that that language was constrained and defined by the upper right behaviors perspective. So we broadened it out and the project became about inhabitation. We developed an intention for the project, which was this, to develop an approach for combined qualitative and quantitative assessment of human inhabitation of architectural spaces based on this integral design framework. So again, I think it's very important that you answer the why of what's the purpose that you're up to and also that the project itself develop an intention. And then underlying that intention, there were a couple of reasons. Why did we generate that intention? One answer to the why was because people are the biggest unknown in energy simulation. Anybody who's a energy analyst can tell you it's the people we don't understand. We can we can predict the sun and the temperature and the heat flows and heat storage and mass and all of those things. But people much harder. And that better simulation then leads to designs that create less global climate change. So you might notice here that this involves a change from a current state to a more desirable state. And there was a second why, uh, and that was because human experiences of nature, I say, beget sustainable actions. Uh, and that when you add up those actions collectively, those planet-friendly actions help create life on Earth to thrive. So there's a state change again, and that this is my new hypothesis, at least, that the answer to a good why question involves an intended change of state for a person, a society, a landscape, etc., into a state that we would like to see in the future. So this led us to an overall research question, which was this. Can mixed research methods be integrated via spatial and temporal patterns for a fuller understanding of building inhabitation. So I can't overemphasize how critical I believe it is to be super clear about what your research question is. It's really hard to answer a question that's poorly framed. And then it's almost impossible to develop good methods to answer that question. Yet, in my experience, I find that researchers often go about the business, they go collecting data and designing their methods without clearly knowing either their why or their research question. And you see this a lot when someone's working on a thesis. You say, tell me about your thesis, and it takes a long time to get around to what the real topic is. So they might say, oh, I'm interested in this topic, or there's something in that domain that I'm investigating. Well, what's your question? I'm not sure. So try to be clear. In our case, there was a built-in hypothesis in this question, and we hoped that we could use patterns of space, we're architects, and things that are happening in those spaces as a way to integrate the various perspectives. So I said, if the question is big enough that it requires the methods of multiple perspectives. So now I'm actually going to suggest that if the question is a design research question, then it also requires the methods of multiple perspectives. So using the four fundamental perspectives, our team developed one or two research sub-questions for each quadrant. And actually we developed many more questions than we had the resources or the expertise to help solve. So that's also a learning. From the experiences perspective, we asked what are the spatial temporal patterns of an individual occupant's experience. From the behaviors perspective, we were interested in what were those patterns for things that we could measure or simulate conditions. And also what were the behaviors of the occupants? 
those are both two kinds of behaviors. The stuff that happens in the room or in the building, that could be physics, could be temperature and light, for instance, and the behaviors of, you know, individual people. From um, the perspective of the systems, the question was more about what is the formal architectural order? You know, how does the space itself influence what people are doing? And how do we understand the nature of that space? And then from the cultural perspective, it was more about how could the, what could we know about the background cultural narratives that might form a context for those individual occupant behaviors and experiences? Now, each perspective has its viable methods that reveal knowledge that's valid from that perspective, but not valid from the others. So the research design problem became how to select the methods that would fit what counts for value from that quadrant's authentic perspective, as developed by people that have, you know, the, the community of researchers um, that have validated what counts in that particular perspective. So in the upper left, we wanted to know about the individual occupant's experience, and we created a method for cognitive mapping using speak aloud protocols. And those were recorded by audio and video cameras worn by the participants. So put little cameras on their heads, and Astrid will tell you about this. This was a new territory, so we were, as architects, basically making it up. Uh, trying to make up a method to get inside the perspective of an individual person's thoughts and feelings. In the upper right, we could measure the on-site environmental conditions, and we could also observe and record what the participants did in the space and how they moved. So for this, some of the team then had to take on the role of being a building scientist. In the lower right, we could learn about the order of the space with the familiar tools of spatial analysis, drawing, diagramming. So for this, we needed a graphically competent architectural theorist, somebody who could think about space and think about how to represent it. So let me just make one argument here for those of you who, like me, might have started in design as a a creative practice as a professional practice and moved into scholarship or research, you can still draw. So the graphic tools that designers use are actually powerful for revealing things like the patterns of space and lots of things, as you know, happen in space. So in the lower left, finally, we interviewed the study participants to learn about their cultural and physical backgrounds relative to these issues. So for this, we were not really skilled at it. We needed psychologists. So we got some folks from the psychology department to come in. So this is, ah. So I just wanna uh, round that up with a series of principles here that I'm trying to articulate. One is that each perspective generates unique questions. Each of these requires different methods. And each method is value, has value in its own domain. And each of those methods then discloses results that are different and reveal different aspects of the same overall problem looking at it from a different place. And that that different knowledge that's required, those different domains of knowledge may require some differentiation of roles of people on the team or to like we had to do go and get an expert that knows about how to do that methodology the other the other correlate to that is that we can also stretch ourselves to become familiar with the language and methods that we may have not been so familiar with so that's the basic introduction and i am now going to thankfully pass this over to Astrid, and she's going to tell you in a little bit more detail about this project. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks very much, Margarita, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, and I will share my slides. Um, oh man. 
and here we go. Um, do the slides work? Yes. To yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, so before I go into the details of the project itself, I'd just like to acknowledge the project team because this was really a team project, as Mark already said. So besides Mark and myself, we had Akari Nakai Kit, we had Anna Klaas, Abdul Manan Sadik, Vanessa Wittem, and Lucy Zinkiewicz. And that was really, yes, as Mark mentioned, the, we were covering the disciplines of architectural science, architectural design, and psychology all together. Um, I'll start a little bit with the background and methodological approach to this project. So the inspiration for this was really the International Energy Agency Annex 66 project that I was a part of um, in past years. This was about definition and simulation of occupant behavior in buildings. And the project started with the idea that occupant behavior was really about behaviors, movement and actions. At the end of the project, after a few years, um, this image was created and the realization was that occupant behavior as defined initially is really situated in a larger system in a systemic context that also includes the building, the psychology and physiology, physiology of the people, comfort, culture, economic parameters. So for our project that I'm going to talk about now, we coined this term human inhabitation to differentiate from the more narrowly defined term occupant behavior. We also realized when we looked at this um, image from Annex 66 that we had objectives as, as well as subjective parameters. So the objective parameters including the building itself and what was defined as occupant behavior, the observable behavior, um, and then subjective parameters um, involving the psychology of people, cultural parameters, comfort, perception and so forth. And that really lent itself to this integral approach because I think it's one of the unique strengths of the integral framework is this integration of subjective and objective perspectives. So the next step was we were trying to map this image from before into the four quadrants. And in doing that, we get the following picture. In the upper left quadrant, we get occupant experience. So that involves feelings, emotions, perception, sensation, personal interpretation. In the lower left quadrant, we get group narratives, cultural norms, collective meanings. In the upper right, we get occupant behaviors. That's the measurable conditions and processes as well as observable behaviors. And in the lower right, activity space nexus, so that's spatial temporal patterns of architectural order, of social activity and use, as well as building operation. Next, I'm going to talk about the study setup for our pilot project. So for us, this really was a pilot project, um, the first time testing um, a project framed through this, this integral research approach. And one question we were trying to answer specifically here was what is the decision making logic of students when selecting a preferred place to study? The preferred place to study they could choose from was is shown in this floor plan here. It's a public area um, at the Deakin Waterfront Campus in Geelong in Australia. And as you can see from the photos, the spaces were quite different from a from an architectural point of view the the spatial proportions and and um, the spatial design was quite varying so within this space the students our student participants uh, in this project had to find their preferred place to study if they were imagining they had to go and sit somewhere for studying where would that be and this is um Again, a breakdown of the research questions and the methodologies. So Mark already mentioned we had one um, sub question, sub research question for each quadrant. 
And um, in the upper left, the question was, what are spatial temporal patterns of individual occupants experience? So here we used the think aloud method, which meant the participants were wandering through the space and voicing their experiences in the moment of, of the experience. And that was recorded with the variable camera on their head. So we got video and audio out of that. The audio was then transcribed and we used semantic analysis, which is a methodology from psychology to analyze this data. In the lower left quadrant, the question was, what are background cultural narratives for individual experiences and behaviors? Here we obtained the data through semi-structured interviews that followed on after the participants had experienced the space. We got audio recordings of these interviews and then again they were transcribed and we used thematic analysis um, to analyze the data. In the upper right quadrant, the question was what are spatial temporal patterns of measured conditions? Here we conducted indoor and outdoor environmental measurements. So we had a comfort card and um, were measuring the the common and indoor environmental parameters at the preferred place of study and some other places that the um, participants found as significant. And then we, we, we visualized the results in diagrams. And last but not least, the research question in the lower right was, um, what are spatial patterns of formal architectural order? Um, for, for this quadrant, we created models of the case study space. So that was a 2D and a 3D model. And then we analyzed um, these uh, spatial data and you'll see some images uh, about that on the next slides. So this is just a brief overview on the data types. And you can see here in the upper left in this video, you can get an impression what the video data were that we gathered from this analysis um, and also of the spatial diversity. In the upper right quadrant, you can see the, our comfort card that we used, used to measure the indoor environmental parameters. And then in the lower right, you can see, you can get an idea of um, the 3D cut model that we developed and the resolution that we had there. Um. So um, that's the setup and now to the results. So for this question, what is the decision making logic of students for selecting the preferred place to study? That was like the first part of, of sub questions that we were trying to answer. The first observation was that there was a difference between task related and individual parameters. So by task related parameters, I mean ones that were reported by all participants and that we attribute to the fact that students were supposed to find a place to study. So we basically predefined the task of studying and that in return made all participants look for a place that offered prospect and refuge, had good, uh, um, good lighting, uh, pleasant temperature and was a quiet space. So there was a clear link between these parameters and the task of studying. And then there were individual parameters that also played a role for people's preferences, but they were not necessarily reported by all participants. And we grouped these into architectural design, microclimate or cultural context. For the task related parameters, one interesting one was prospect and refuge. This one we didn't see coming and it was one of the strong um, results from our study. Every single one of the participants um, reported that they were basically seeking for a balance between prospect and refuge. So that they wanted to have their back in some kind of cave-like refuge situation with the back to the wall, ideally with, with walls on three sides, but then they wanted in front of them, they wanted to also be able to get prospect to have an idea what was going on around them without actually being involved. So this this kind of threshold, this balance between prospect and refuge was pretty much what everybody was was looking for. And in these images, you can see a 360 um, layout, um, 360 degree layout of 
the preferred place to study to to show you um, what this balance between prospect and refuge was. So the second task related parameter was the microclimate, and this was less surprising. Um, so obviously for a study task, everybody was looking for a quiet place, well lit, not glary, and with pleasant temperatures. And these, the photos you can see here were the two most preferred study spaces that people selected. And then for the individual parameters, um, so I'm showing the images for the two most preferred um, spaces, which was the green alcove of which you can see the photos here and the courtyard. There's photos of that on the next slide. So this was again interesting, the individual parameters um, because they were so diverse. Um, for example, this space here, the green alcove was preferred because of the symbolism of the color green being associated with, with the healthy harvesting season. Someone else said they have a lumbar injury and they were looking for ideally ergonomic share and this was the best they could find. Um, someone else reported that the prospect from the place they were sitting in this alcove had lots of architectural detail to look at and that was really interesting. And if another person said this, this environment here reminds me of our old house in India. So there were memories from the past. And then for the courtyard, um, similar diversity in, in um, preferences. So again, someone found a resemblance to their backyard here too. So again, memories from past experiences. Um, several participants liked this space because it had a bit of a breeze going. It was a, we conducted the study in a, on a warm spring day. So there was a slight breeze going and it was quite pleasant to be outside. So people were looking for this kind of elevated airspeed. Outside fresh air as opposed to inside air. And then the participants who selected this space um, tended to be people who had had a very outdoorsy upbringing um, and or the end or they had grown up in a space with little heating in a building with little heating and poor insulation, which is quite common in Australia, um, which means that if you live in these spaces, um, you, you get much closer fluctuations of the indoor temperature, like the indoor temperatures match outdoor conditions much more closely than in in um, northern European homes, for example. So if we were mapping all the findings that we had, the, the parameters people mentioned into the four quadrants, in the upper left quadrant, we get personal health issues, past experience, and the degree of visual interest. In the lower left, symbolism, lifestyle, and the climatic context during the upbringing. Upper right, sound, light, glare, temperature, airspeed and air quality. And lower right, prospect and refuge. What was interesting, an interesting lesson we learned from this integral approach was that the right hand side is basically asking the question what? So here we get the objective patterns and behaviors and most of them are the same for all participants or even for all humans because as humans we are more or less the same kind of size and scale or body temperature is similar or visual spectrum is similar and also the task of studying was predefined for this study. On the subjective left hand side we learned the reasons for this behind these objective patterns and we also um, found reasons for individual deviations, which was very interesting. So we realized that the answers to the question why came from the left hand side and the observations of what were actually patterns of behavior came from the right hand side. Conclusions for collaboration across the disciplines through this project were in terms of potentials. This um, framework, this, this integral framework was basically a neutral reference point for collaboration. It didn't come out of anybody's discipline and that way it felt inclusive for everyone. Um, it helped in gaining clarity for combining methodologies for data collection and analysis. And it also helped to identify a common denominator for our quadrants. In our case, that was the space. Everything we looked at had a spatial dimension. 
in terms of challenges. Um, one challenge we found was the navigation of different disciplinary quality standards. For example, in psychology, a lot of studies have hundreds of participants and with the different data collection methods we had, that would have been um, impossible quantities of data, at least for our small team. Um, and also we realized we needed to define the term terminology at the beginning because, for example, the word space means something different to an architect or to a psychologist. So um, now to a second part of the results, like we were looking at the results from also from different quadrants or from different perspectives to some degree. So this part is focusing on the two upper quadrants. And here another question could be answered, which was can occupants verbalized experiences of environmental conditions be used for objective environmental quality decision making? So commonly, if in buildings we are interested in feedback from occupants about the indoor environmental quality, the approach would be to set up a survey, a questionnaire, hand it out to occupants and then do a statistical analysis on the results. And that might help um, the results of that might help control buildings like uh, through facilities management, man management, they might have an influence. So this is the common approach. Um, the advantages of a questionnaire survey is that it's quick and structured. Um, the disadvantage is that it's um, potentially subject to acquiescence bias, which means that uh, participants have a tendency to re respond positively to a question. Um, and what surveys can't do is provide rich contextual data. So they usually give this a scale on which you have to tick your preference. In contrast to that natural language, like the spoken word voiced in 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 real time, um, provides the rich contextual data. It can address the bias. Um, the only challenge is that it's unstructured data. So in order to address this research question, um, we asked the participants not only to look for the preferred place to study, but also to find the most intense place for temperature, air movement, sound and light. And here we compared the voicing, the, the voice recordings from the think aloud method, what people said at, at these different spaces about the conditions. We compared that directly with the field measurements that our measurement equipment was giving us. So here, here are some, some um, illustrations of the results. Um, this, for example, is about air movement. And in this example, you can clearly see the measurement equipment was detecting elevated air velocity and people were also commenting on how much the air was moving. The same for sound. So this was um, the this was recorded in quite a busy space with a lot of people walking around, which was what people were commenting on. And that was also reflected in the measurements of the of the space, the noise measurements. Then for light, this is an example at a very in bright uh, space with almost 12,000 lux, um, and people were commenting here how bright it is and how it intense it feels on their eyes. And then the same again for temperature, when the measurement equipment detected higher temperature, um, that was also reflected in the comments of the participants. For the preferred place to study, it was a combination of factors that people were looking for. So not too hot, not too cold. They liked a degree of breeze, but they didn't like the wind um, and they wanted good lighting. So again, the comments, the qualitative comments that people made about why they liked the space were also matching the data that we got from our measurement equipment. So in conclusion, we can say that actually this equation worked um, that we were wondering about when we started um, the analysis. The human perception of environmental conditions did actually match the measured environmental conditions. And also um, what was obvious from the study was that the um, preference, the measurements as well as the, the 
comments by participants were clearly different between the preferred place to study and the most intense places to study for air movement, sound, light and temperature. So there was a clear difference between the preferred and the most intense space. And that was something we were expecting to find. In terms of future applications, we imagine um, that a future step in this project could be to look more into how we can use natural language data for demand driven control in buildings so that maybe the buildings can be controlled in real time by um, taking spoken feedback into account so that would um, require natural language processing and as this is dealing with quite potentially quite big data sets in, in bigger buildings, it could be an interesting application for artificial in intelligence to, yeah, to analyze the unstructured nat natural language, which is currently the challenge for, for this type of data. And here's another outlook on um, where, we, where we will be heading next. Um, so after this, this first project with, where we gained some experience with the four quadrants and the different research questions, we would also like to explore more these, we call it 16 spaces of human inhabitation, which is basically the four quadrants and the four levels um, in this matrix. Um, so we would like to explore the levels as well. This is a brief overview on the related publications so far, and there's a few more um, currently in the pipeline. And yeah, with that, I will hand back to Mark. So um, I just love the way that when you're working on a collective project like that, the what's possible becomes much more than what any individual could do on their own. Um, so this methodology begins to help that to, to occur, actually occur. And what, what we've been talking about here, we call the integral research approach. And that tries to distinguish it from this example that I'm showing you here. We sort of stop short of what Ken Wilber calls integral methodological pluralism, which is a bit more complicated. Um, so he further distinguishes these categories of methods as being something where you can take the perspective of being inside or outside of each one of those quadrants. Uh, so if, for example, if we think about the upper left, if we're looking at human experience from the inside, that is from being a human being, that would be a discipline like phenomenology. Um, it doesn't have a lot to say about big structures, but it has everything to say about an individual experience. On the other hand, if we're looking at the human interior, that is the upper left, the human interior, what people see, feel, think from the outside, then we might use a more structuralist approach, such as um, Piaget or other developmental psychologists. So, um, one of the next tasks, in addition to those 16 spaces that Astrid was talking about, the, another thing that we want to be working on next is to see whether or not all these classes of methods have a place in design research. For now, I can say that mostly we're looking at the exteriors of each one of these. That's what's outside the circle. But the bigger point is that for the design fields, each fundamental perspective has its own methods. And for example, here are just a few types of inquiry in each quadrant. In the upper right, we might do environmental measurements, cost analysis, performance simulation. In the lower right, mapping, diagramming, uh, space syntax, uh, various kinds of landscape analysis. Maybe we use a GIS system. In the lower left, collective dialogue becomes important. The humanistic methods come into play and so forth. And then the upper left, the individual contemplation, direct experience, on-site sketching as a way to understand the world, um, any kind of focused awareness practices, aesthetic perceptions. So you could keep generating uh, various methodologies that are used in design research and I think the point is here that they're going to answer different questions. 
Now I want to show you just in the, a couple of more techniques here um, that I think are useful for this approach. Um, uh, last time I showed you some examples from my book, Sun, Wind and Light. In integral terms, it's right side pretty much, lower right spatial order combined with upper right energy and lighting behaviors. I also showed you this nine level system of spatial scale and complexity, neighborhoods at the top and building parts, uh, materials at the bottom. Of course, the top could keep going up, become cities and regions and so forth. Starting in about 2002, just after we finished the second edition, we started to use this system of scales to map out all the design strategies from the second edition. It's here, we can call this a holarchy, which is like a hierarchy, but nested. So we have a nested network of relationships, and this works really well in the lower right when we're thinking about space uh, and organizations of space. Um, so it also organizes um, these patterns such that the lower the pattern, it helps to contribute to something larger than itself. And it also helps to organize and is composed of patterns that are smaller than itself. So we use this to look for the gaps and you can see a few unnamed blank squares in here. So we were already recognizing that things were missing. So we began to ask a question uh, for everyone. If we know we have a pattern at one level, then what's the larger pattern that it helps to build? Is there one already there or not? In the same way, for that pattern, we can look lower and ask, what are its constituent patterns? What are the smaller patterns that it helps to organize? Well, if, if you know Chris Alexander's A Pattern Language, uh, you may recognize that this is a more formalized version of what he called a lattice-like hierarchy, and that shows up in the pattern language. And in this case, the blue rectangles in these diagrams represent the gaps that we found. So those were, strategies not existing in the second edition. We thought we had a fairly organized, complete knowledge base, but we were missing two entire levels, neighborhoods and whole buildings. And we were also very weak on the daylighting strategies, which are on the left side of this diagram. So this moves down in scale, uh, gets smaller and smaller. And we had, we had rooms and we had organizations of rooms, but we had nothing up at the level of the whole building. And again, more missing daylighting strategies. We were paying a lot more attention to heating and cooling and ventilation issues uh, on site with passive systems than we were daylighting. And it just became obvious as we mapped it. And so this is how we define the task of research and writing in what followed for really a, a period of several years in developing the third edition of that work. Now, I also showed you um, some concepts from the Integral Sustainable Design book last time. And we talked about how when you can intersect developmental levels with different perspectives. Uh, in this case, I call it the 16 prospects uh, for inhabitation. We were calling it the 16 spaces. Same, same basic idea here. We're looking at sustainable design. And this framework then provided a theoretical challenge question for each prospect. How were we to understand sustainable design from each level in each quadrant? And so it's a way of blowing up and like uh, expanding the possibilities for any research question that you're interested in. So in this case, we, we just said, okay, each one of these looks different. How is nature experienced, for example? in this experiences perspective by someone looking through the lens of each of these worldviews. What was a pre-modern idea of nature and how do we experience it? What's a modern idea of nature and how do we experience that? So you can really expand and open up your inquiry by looking through these different lenses. Now, this is a more accurate mapping of the content of the project and the 16 prospects. And we knew that the right-hand quadrants were much more well-developed. Sun, wind, and light, the previous project, is mostly about those right-side perspectives. So the big challenge for me became, how do I understand these left-side perspectives of cultures and experience? So each one of those 
prospects, each one of the 16 got developed to some level, but there were just so many more questions in the lower left where we were looking at how to design to connect people to nature and many more questions in the upper left where we were looking at how to give people rich human experiences of nature and natural forces. So the point of this is, is that if you can employ a structure, it can open up any research question dramatically by using the model of perspectives. Secondly, that not every prospect has to be treated equally in every project. Instead, we refer to this as an integrally informed methodology. That is, you're aware of the possibilities and as a human being and looking at the resources that you have available, the question you want to really answer, um, you can begin to select the levels and the perspectives and therefore then the methodologies to investigate that question. So I hope that this has offered a brief introduction to the integral research approach and that it will be helpful to you that it's possible to expand the vision that you have for your own research projects. In the upcoming lectures in this series, you will see a variety of approaches to design questions that are employing the integral thought. Um, next time, I'll be joined by Suzanne Bennett, my editor, co-lecturer, workshop facilitator for many years, and we're married, good for me. Um, and we'll be sharing an approach to how we speak internationally on the topic of solving the climate crisis by design. We'll look at multiple ways to use an integral approach to understand the climate crisis. And so this is more of an analytic use than a research use, but it still helps to understand the problem. And we'll also look at how to uncover the solutions using different perspectives. So in this case, it's a strategic application, and I think of that as something that's more of a design-oriented application. On April the 12th, I'll be working and speaking here with Greek architect and architectural photographer Pygmalion Karatsas. We've taught together and we have another course um, planned for next year. Uh, he, we use an integral approach to study and practice and teach about photography and we include the quadrants. So it's also a, a way of using integral for scholarship, for understanding the history and theory of that discipline of architectural photography. And we'll look at levels, in this case, uh, modern, postmodern, integral. We'll also look at types, which I'm not showing you. I'm gonna save that one for next time. So in combination, this is an application that's intended to both understand practice and also yield some methods for practice. And then finally, the last in the series will be with Melanie Watchman from Laval in Quebec. I'll show you a few teasers on that next time. We'll be sharing both the narratives about connecting to nature and some new work on biophilic design. So in this project, we'll be talking about using the integral for theory building, for scholarly analysis, and for research that's generating or tended to generate new biophilic design tools. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, now hopefully we can bring uh, Astrid back and answer any questions that you might have, have a little conversation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Astrid. Uh, I am uh, very interested uh, to this process of knowledge and uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, to the participant if there are uh, some questions. I look at the chat. Uh, is there any question? Okay. I try to uh, reflect uh, in something for uh, introducing uh, a question session. <laughs> I hope. Please, uh, uh, I would like to understand better. In this process uh, of quadrants, of knowledge and quadrants, uh, I think that uh, there is a um, a kind of assessment of architecture 
and uh, and project. Uh, this is uh, more difficult uh, to uh, um, to try to understand the making of a project. When you uh, enter in the four quadrants uh, um, logic, uh, you can understand the necessity but uh, the, the process of making uh, and the time in the, in the project making is something that uh, uh, is not uh, directly visible. Is this uh, a character of, uh, of this approach or not? What do you think about? If I hear you correctly, you're asking, is there um, a, a particular character of the results of the architecture that's created using an integral approach? Uh, Did I get that, so, that right? Sorry, Mark, may you repeat your... Uh, I, yes, I was just trying to clarify the question. Um, do you mean that you're, you are you asking if the architecture that might be generated through an integral approach would have a certain character to its result? Yeah, uh, but also the question is about uh, uh, a kind of uh, um, of assessment process in in this uh, uh, in this quadrant. Uh, this quadrant logic, no, the integral logic, and uh, uh, this uh, this is uh, easier to uh, understand uh, the um, the assessment of uh, architecture uh, mediated by the quadrant uh, logic, and uh, it's a, it is more difficult to understand the making of of project. Yeah, yeah I, okay. I, I would agree with that. Um, Astrid shaking her head over here. Uh, Astrid, do you want to jump in and comment on this? No, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's probably where the levels get closest, like the making, if you talk, refer with making to the design process, then um, I guess the levels to some degree have this temporal dimension um, and we design a building not only for the moment when it's built but for its entire lifespan so we might be projecting forward in each quadrant like what what might the experience be in in 30 years time and what might the context be in 30 years time and maybe that's something that is yet to be explored more good that's a good point i i would just respond and say that I believe that each of the perspectives already has its methodology inside of architectural design. So uh, I can hire a consultant or I could be a, a more technologically oriented architect. Um, for instance, uh, a Renzo Piano. I might uh, combine that technology with the perspective of aesthetics and human experience that architects already think about and so forth. So the question really is about um, how do you keep from isolating and taking a singular view that one methodology would propose and instead begin to take into account the various factors that always come into play when you have buildings. But these are more design process questions. I, I think that one is still up for grabs. Um, we were just trying to grapple with um, with this application to uh, more of a research oriented question rather than a design question. Uh, but it's it's equal it's equally valid to explore that. OK, thank you. I would like to look at some uh, uh, works 
architectural works integrally informed. Uh, that uh, that is uh, the process of project uh, from the uh, from the thinking, the methodology of uh, of design process, and then the work. It would be a, a good uh, connection between the the methodology and the work itself. Uh, thank you so much. Um, there is another question uh, from Marco, Marco Capponi, please. Uh, do you want to, to ask yes. your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Margrit. And thank you very much for your lecture, Professor Decay and uh, Retzel. Uh, maybe my question is uh, very uh, similar to the question of um, Margherita, but uh, from uh, a different perspective, I think. Um, I would like to focus on these spatial and temporal patterns. Uh, if I understood uh, uh, correctly, uh, it is through these spatial and temporal patterns that uh, you would like to, uh, how to say, uh, overcome uh, that uh, uh, universal approach that you recognize in modernist approach, uh, as you say in uh, your paper. But uh, um, how do you match these patterns uh, when they are developed by uh, people with different experiences, cultures and so on? So starting from differences, from similarities. And uh, so this is the first question. The second one is uh, maybe more historical <laughs> about your uh, training, maybe. Um, I would like to understand uh, how much um, has uh, your approach been uh, influenced by Christopher Alexander's pattern, uh, pattern language, uh, if this is the, the definition. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll just take the uh, second question first and then ask Astrid to uh, address okay. the first one. Uh, uh, well, I, I went to graduate school on the west coast of the United States where Alexander is well known. So I did encounter his work there. Um, and I, I think he's one of the few people that has tried to use a, a systems theory kind of thinking to um, to organize shared design knowledge. So from that standpoint, I really like the way that um, it becomes possible when once you develop some kind of a, a structured language to then begin to have multiple people um, contribute to that larger vision of knowledge that can be shared about design. But, um, you know, other than that, I think um, in certain ways of thinking, uh, this is, uh, you know, not a direction that he, uh, Alexander would be talking about. Yeah. Although, you know, in, in the later work and the in the, the newest uh, four volume series about the nature of order, um, I think there is a, a certain transpersonal perspective that's embodied there um, uh, about the nature of life and the relationship between architectural space and life. So I find that intriguing, although I'm still trying to understand it. But uh, I think theoretically most of the work here is is basically taking the uh, basic perspective of, of integral thinking as developed in Ken, Ken Wilber's work and then asking, well, how do we begin to apply this more universal set of perspectives back to the question of the built environment, the landscape, so on. So the, I think if I hear your first question, it was about um, uh, maybe connecting and relating the quadrants or perspectives through the notion of space and design. And Astrid has um, started thinking about, and she's got some papers, early papers, looking at how they get related and connected. So we, that, that's one problem, I think, is that, uh, yes, we have developed these disciplines. And historically, in my education, those disciplines were just claiming to be right and sort of throwing stones at each other. 
<laughs> and now I think we're we're saying, all right, but let's let's look at what they how they're they're all true partially and how they can contribute to a larger understanding. So Asser, do you have some things to add about that question? Um, yeah, maybe correct me if I'm wrong um, in understanding your question. Um, I guess the term spatial temporal patterns for us was quite generic. It just refers to the fact that everything that happened in any of the four quadrants could basically be located to a point in the space on the floor plan and also a point in time. So the experience happened at a particular time in a particular space. And for example, that was, there was a dyn dynamism in there in the sense that this kind of cave situation where people prefer to sit was, for example, I, I was talking to a student and he said, yeah, daytime, I would go there, but come nighttime and it gets a bit lonely and a bit dark, I would sit right in the middle of an atrium because these little nooks are then not feeling safe anymore. So we realized that the perception, the experiences that people had were depending on the space as well as the time during which they occurred. So I hope that answers or it goes in the direction of answering your question. Yes, just to add one thing to that. Um, so Wilbur would say that the the quadrants are co-arising. That all four um, fundamental realities are con constantly available to us. Um, and that it's simply the methods that we choose, the, the injunctions and the methodologies, then bring that, bring a certain world into being, but it's there, right, available for us all the time. We just, in our somewhat more limited perception, take one of those at a time. And we've gotten really good in our disciplines about just doing one of those things kinds of perspective, just looking at architecture as an art, for instance, right? Or just looking at architecture as a pure set of behaviors in the realm of physics, like a structural engineer might look at it. Each of those is true, valid, but when they come together, that's when architecture for me and all scales of design get really interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. Stefano has a question. Yes, I have a question. Hi to Astrid Hi, and uh, everybody. <laughs> very, very interesting uh, uh, lecture. And maybe my question is uh, more a comment uh, first, uh, and then I have a question more uh, directly to, to Astrid, to your research, to your work. Uh, and uh, so, it's similar to, to Margarita, maybe I understand which is the difficult now, it's also for me as a designer somehow. So at the moment I, I see this um, methodology as uh, more useful as an, an analysis method rather than a design uh, tool. So my difficult to understand and I hope that all your <laughs> seminar that we have in front of uh, which uh, clarify this um, uh, this doubt for for the moment but this is the my comment then uh, I, I have a, a question for Astrid that only for uh, for example this kind of um, analysis you did with the students you now uh, which place they choose uh, so simply you uh, did a um, questionnaire and some it was some questions and uh, how do you collect them? Uh, there were some other uh, experts that are working with you, not only you uh, uh, managing uh, all this uh, uh, question. And uh, last, uh, how do you interpret the, which is the interpretation of this answer in relation, for example, to the culture of the students. Now, I imagine your university as an international uh, university with a lot of students, one by India, one other by uh, Europe. Maybe my preferred place is, for example, the courtyard to study because I love the sun in a place and so on. 
how do you manage these differences between uh, cultures? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, to your first part of your question, um, we didn't do survey. We did one survey that was just a little demographic survey where we asked um, where's, where people grew up, um, in what, what country, what climate um, they had grown up, um, what kind of um, level of education they had, like typical um, sociological questions. And other than that, the data collection was more qualitative. So we had these semi-structured interviews where the psychologist on our team was having a conversation with the participants after the walkthrough and was basically getting them to re reflect on their experiences and also to reflect on how it relates to past experiences in architecture, in particular the house where they grew up because we assumed that would be the strongest experience they had. So from a methodological point of view, it was more qualitative than quantitative, and that's where we ended up with these enormous data sets. Um, and then um, your point with the cultural links, that was actually something very interesting um, that came out of the results. For example, the participants who selected the courtyard were without exception students who had grown up in a radius of 100 kilometers around the university, like in a very similar climate zone. And they were the, the lifestyle in, in this area is very outdoorsy. And I guess the typical building, the typical house in, in this region is not very well insulated. It's single glazing and in winter it goes down to five degrees outdoor temperature and then indoors you've got 10, 12 maybe. So if you live here, you're very used to being pretty cold in winter, which also means I guess you toughen up a fair bit and these people who selected the outdoor courtyard, they almost felt indoor was too controlled. They felt like, yeah, they needed to go out. And we realized that we had a lot of international students also participating and none of them, none of the people from Malaysia and from, from Singapore, from China, they were not selecting the outdoor space. And maybe someone growing up in, in New Delhi um, wouldn't naturally be drawn to, to using an outdoor space. So our, our small sample size, we only had 20 participants, so it's not statistically formally significant in, in psychology terms, but I, I can see a clear pattern here that the cultural context in which people grew up, this maybe the social cultural context as well as the lifestyle related to the climate had a very strong strong impact on people's preferences. I, that's my hypothesis. Uh, I think related to that question, it's a really good question there, Stefano, about um, how you respond to the variations, to the differences. And in, in this particular study, there was no ability for the participants to adjust any parameters. Uh, they could not pull the shades, open the windows, uh, change the, the cooling system, uh, anything at all, turn on a fan. Uh, their only option for adaptation was migration, to move from one place to the next. And so I think the lesson is um, that we, we look for the things that are consistent and we try to design the general environment for those, but then we also provide uh, opportunities for adaptation. And many ways, of course, that we can create adaptation, adaptation of the same space or as in this, this study, um, the opportunity to adapt your, you know, to find your preferred location based on its conditions. And if you provide that spectrum of opportunities, then it, it fits, uh, it's always fits somewhat. So it's moving away from maybe the um, uh, 20th century idea that every place gets the same conditions. Yes, I, you are different. right, Mark, because, uh, for example, I was actually was thinking about the public spaces, the new contemporary design of public spaces that are going towards uh, a less design, less uh, design of every part, every function, so very clear. 
to permit people, to permit uh, citizens or whatever, uh, to use the space freely more in a way uh, to understand the, the, the space. So it's quite uh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so sure, we've um, maybe in the 20th century, we began to associate uh, a single use, one, one use with one space. Uh, in the pre-industrial building, we had um, each space might have many uses. And if I want to read a book, I don't just go to my desk. Uh, if I want to read a book, I go to the light, right? In the pre-industrial architecture. So uh, I think that recognition that a variable set of conditions across space and time uh, provides the opportunity for occupants to adapt. And maybe I learned a little bit about this, uh, I, I got stronger in this belief based on uh, the results from the study that Astrid's been describing. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Massimo? Yes, if if I can, I don't know if you can hear me. I I try to link with Stefano and also with the other the last part uh, talking about public spaces because uh, of course thank you for uh, both your presentation and uh, your research somehow uh, reminds me or suggests me a way to study and thinking about public spaces in in the landscape and in in our cities. Um, uh, as Marco, uh, as Mark uh, know, I already tried to to do in my research the the all different quadrant uh, views, and I think that uh, in the history of uh, studying cities, uh, uh, also maybe in, unconsciously, uh, the architects, the urbanists, uh, uh, try to to have all these different focus, maybe in not at the same times, but uh, more or less uh, we can study a city coming from the maps or coming from the data of uh, I don't know uh, how many cars, how many square meter of green spaces we have, uh, uh, the culture of the public spaces and also how people use them. Um, my question is uh, about uh, is if it's possible to have some interferences uh, between those quadrants. Because, for example, if I think about uh, the work of uh, young girl uh, uh, watching people uh, living and stay in the public spaces, the first thing that I think is that is in the upper left quadrant, but uh, I'm not sure about this because it's an external uh, observer about that. It's uh, quite uh, it's similar that uh, uh, if the municipality say to me that uh, in uh, San Marco Square there are 1000 uh, person every day, for example, I don't know. Uh, the only difference is that uh, there is the direct observation of this data and of course how the people are using the place, but it's not a, the, the direct uh, experience. For you, Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, Astrid, would you like to answer that? Um. I think um, the space itself is probably, I would probably put that in the lower right quadrants and then the experience that a person has in that space, that's the upper left. So I think there's already the synergies are already in the nature of the project because the, the experience is tied to a particular space and the play space itself can be measured and, and um, and so that, I guess, belongs to the lower right, at least from my understanding of, of um, what what you were saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then there's probably a cultural context. I don't know, maybe people in a public space in, in Venice are behaving a bit differently to a public space in Beijing. I don't know. And maybe even the tourists as a cultural group, as opposed to the locals, would, would have different um, maybe behavioral patterns. So there's a cultural dimension, I guess, related to the context of the people. And then there's different behaviors that you could observe in the upper right. So it sounds to me already like it, it's covering the 
it could pretend what you're describing covers for me the quadrants um, already. I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Esther. That's that's very thorough. Um, you're you're always really thorough, and I'm impressed that you can uh, still be articulate at the <laughs> a.m. in the morning now. Uh, so, uh, Massimo, sometimes um, we we think about it like this. Um, on the left hand uh, quadrants, we ask why, and on the right hand quadrants, we ask what. So we have what I as an individual do, that's my behaviors, if I observe those behaviors upper right. Why I do, why I behave this way, I have to ask the individual. We have to inquire inside them. Right? We can observe what they do, but we may have no idea why. The same thing for the group, the collective why we do and what we do. And that's a sort of simple way to, to get at it. Thank you. Thank you. There is another question from uh, uh, Fabre, Gabriel. Please, right. Gabriel, okay, thank you. Uh, you are online, Gabriel. Yeah, hear me. Okay, please. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, very interesting. I have a question, uh, not very specific, very large question, but um, I'm thinking uh, what I said previously about the fact that you have a lot of evidence that go we from around the world. Uh, in a in a okay. good way, Gabriel. The connection is not good. Uh, uh, do you hear? Me? Do you hear me better? Uh, perhaps it's better uh, to uh, put off the uh, the camera and write your question, please. Because it's I, not. I make a try. Do you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, my question was about um, what we said earlier about the fact that you have a lot of students that comes all around the world in your in university. Um, I wonder. Uh, I, I'm thinking too about the the project of Le Corbusier at uh, at Chandigarh that is a project from a um, an European man uh, in uh, Oriental country. And I'm I'm asking this question is do you think that um, problem in a country or environmental problem, uh, ecologic problem can be solved by, by a man that uh, is systematically uh, comes from a country. Uh, I mean uh, that is long from his country um, or can this problem be solved uh, just by living in this country. I, I think too about the other arch architect, uh, Francis Djebedo uh, uh that made his studies at uh, Monaco, München. And I I think that um, this um, this um, this man that resolved a uh, problem uh, may, may many, many miles ago from uh, from the, the the place where they study, uh, is is this uh, is it for you something that uh, we can't avoid, or the pro this ecologic problem can be solved only staying in the country we live in and we grow in? Um, a, a little bit confused, but I like <laughs> get it. Well, so from the integral research approach, you ask an interesting question. And the first thing we want to do is to identify the what we call the cosmic address of the question. If we identify the perspective of the question, then we have much more chance of beginning to answer it. And we re recognize the value of the question and we recognize the limitations of the question. 
So in this case, um, given the first two lectures here, can, can you find the perspective, the prospect of the question? In other words, what worldview and what quadrant is the question coming from? Oh, well, I will say maybe Okay, I won't. I will be wrong, maybe, but That's maybe okay. in the behavior one, no. In the behavioral one, um, I don't think so. I think you're asking a question which comes from the cultural perspective, because you're asking, can we solve a problem which you're defining as an ecological problem, but you're asking, can we solve that inside the culture only, or also from outside with an imported perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Now that question only arises from what we think of as about the third level, that is a postmodern pluralist worldview. So a modernist would never ask that question. A traditional pre-modern, someone looking at the world from an archaic or a magic or a mythic a tribal or an authoritarian perspective, any of those lower levels, all of that I combine into what I call the traditional. But really, if you look at it as a cultural development, there's a lot of levels there. Um, one of my favorite is Gene Gebser uh, in a book that in English is entitled The Ever-Present Origin, and he describes five different levels, archaic, magic, mythic, and then he goes, uh, and rational, then he goes to integral, but skips over postmodern or plural. He didn't see that coming in the 1920s, I think. But only at that postmodern green pluralist level that we begin to ask questions about cultural identity and definition and, and power and look at the world in that framework, okay? So looked at in that framework all by itself is completely unhealthy looked at that from that perspective including other perspectives is incredibly powerful because then we ask what is universal and what is regional what is inside of regional what is cultural right mm -hmm. and and so if you're just talking about ecology as a lower right exterior systems problem you can solve that any place on the planet as long as you understand the science of ecology. But when human behavior comes into play and the behavior of groups of people acting out of their belief structures, their mythologies, their stories about nature, for example, now we need the lower left cultural perspective and we need actually one level up. We need an integral view of the lower left cultural perspective because it can find the value in each of the other perspectives. And it can also say, look, science is important. You can't solve the ecological problem without science, but you can also not solve the ecological problem without taking into account the large belief systems of cultures, which lead to, in the lower right, social behaviors of large groups of people. For instance, how they use land, or do they grow fish or do they capture the fish out of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that helps a little bit. Um, I hope it's not adding too much to the confusion, but if you're looking at this from a research perspective, that's why I say you have to become aware of the perspective from which you're looking at the world in order to actually have a powerful impact by designing a, you know, a research uh, agenda and methodology that will help to answer the question in its complexity. Just one of those perspectives, just the ecological perspective or just the cultural perspective doesn't do it. And you will find once you begin to integrate those that there's validity all through them. 
some things apply everywhere. As uh, Astrid said to me last night, you know, we're, we're all human beings, and so we have a, a similar nervous system. We're not elephants, right? There's no elephants here uh, online with us today, right? And so some things are actually universal. And the integral perspective allows for universal truths, and it allows for very local differences and a lot of things in between. And that's how I think we have to start looking at questions about culture and region, that they, they apply inside valid territories and domains, right? And those things, we have to figure out what the circles of those are. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. This is another option to recognize values of mediation. That is a part of uh, uh, of uh, our approach, integral approach. And uh, this, uh, I think that that uh, this aspect to recognize recognize uh, uh, values in a different uh, situation, in different scale, in different uh, approach may be also uh, possible uh, by mediation, by something that is the media uh, for, uh, for the understanding. And media is also the project. A project as a, an instrument of knowledge that is uh, uh, something to uh, understand uh, the, the context, the reality, and also to uh, enter um, a perspective, a, a new perspective, an innovation. Uh, I ask uh, if there is some, uh, some question. Another question? No? So I can say you, uh, Mark and you, Astrid, thank you so much. I think that uh, the second lecture uh, has opened the, another perspective from the interior perception of, uh, of the architecture. And uh, I think that uh, you are welcome for the third lecture with Mark and uh, Susan Bennett on uh, uh, the future <laughs> on the future uh, sun when is uh, uh, mark i don't remember the the date but uh, i have here 29 of march 29 two of weeks. march two weeks from now uh, but uh, for us it uh, is something uh, uh, more than two weeks. <laughs> she is the future for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Welcome uh, for uh, this uh, this last uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I'm waiting uh, for you in uh, two weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out once more to Astrid Rotzel for staying up late and being with us. Um, thank you, Astrid, also for your leadership on the research team, um, just for the ongoing conversation and dialogue that helps to push me forward. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Goes both ways. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.